Sivan Pudavong Houghton was born in Vientiane, <coughs> Laos, and at the age of four emigrated with her family from Nong Kai refugee camp in Thailand to Winfield, Kansas. She earned a BFA from the University of Kansas and an MFA from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. She is currently an associate professor at Middle Tennessee State University, where she teaches advanced level painting courses. And in 2014, she won an MTSU Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award. Professor Pudavong Houghton's source material for her research is autobiographical and stems from her personal experience as an observer of everyday culture. She is a multimedia artist using classical and contemporary techniques and materials, and her work has been seen in national and international solo, juried, and invitational exhibits throughout the US, Suriname, Belgium, France, Canada, and New Zealand. Most recently, the Arts at the Embassy program has selected her collaborative artwork with Jared Houghton for a permanent collection at Paramarabo, Suriname. Her paintings have also hung on Gwyneth Paltrow's loft and been featured on goop.com. Um, she has been published in Studio Visit magazine and has been recognized as a new superstar of Southern art by Oxford American. She has partnered with the Frist Center for the Visual Arts Educator for Community Engagement Program with the OASIS Center and with CRIT, which is the Center for Refugees and Immigrants of Tennessee. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Sisavon Pudavon Houghton. I have students here and they wanted me to do cartwheels, but I'm not going to do cartwheels. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. If you had to be here, well, I guess you get to sit through it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Ida <clears throat> talked, and I have a cold, so I apologize. So I'm going to be like drinking and coughing and all that other good stuff. Um, when, <clears throat> first and foremost, initially we, we immigrated to Caney, Kansas, which is a really small town in um, in Kansas, uh, I want to say like probably, I don't know, uh, it's near Oklahoma. Uh, anyway, but there weren't uh, any jobs there. So my family had to move up to Winfield where there were tons of uh, factories and things like that. So if you don't speak a language and there's nothing that you can do, well, you go work in factories. Um, my dad was a doctor in Laos and he actually worked in the refugee camps. Um, and so in Nong Kai, which Ida mentioned earlier, uh, this is one of the photos that uh, they, uh, the, the newspaper crew took a ton of photo of us. And I actually have some photos of us in um, an airplane. Uh, I think they're uh, good old Polaroids. And anyway, <clears throat> but, and those are only the photos that we have. All the other photos were uh, taken away and were burnt in Nong Kai. There was a big fire there in the refugee camp. And then, um, and then a lady in, uh, 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 what I want to say, Vieng Chan, which is the capital of Laos, where we escaped Laos into Thailand, stole all of our documents. So that's that, right? So um, anyway, we landed in, um, I'm going to go back a little bit. We landed in Thailand for two years. I was there for two years for the refugee camp. And then we um, got sponsored by a Baptist church in Caney, Kansas. And so there, I, we moved up to Kansas, and um, I grew up in Kansas. <clears throat> There's no place like home. Should I do the tap thing? There's no place like home. <laughs> um, 80s fashion statement. So growing up, so if you <laughs> see my sister's attire, she's got you know the Laotian fashion with the, um, the dress, and then the, the great, what, what would you guys call it, like the 70s patchwork kind of shirt. And then me, I don't even know what I look like. Um, like a doll of some sort. But anyway, um, this inspired, uh, this growing up and learning Laotian and then English and Laotian being my first language is a lot of this language barrier and all this disconnect. And even when I'm talking, you will notice that. Even my students who are in here will notice I'll get things wrong. Um, but uh, 
that's, that's what happens when you merge two cultures into one, you clash and then you're learning uh, English, the English language um, in, in school and then you're you know, coming home and then you're immersed into the Laotian language and then so you're speaking both languages and you're trying to learn all this all at once, just imagine all of that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, so, <clears throat> so when I went, well initially, I went to the University of Kansas because I, I got a huge scholarship. I was uh, one of, my husband likes to say, one of the valedictorians out of seven out of our high school. Um, I was the straight A student kid. You know, I did everything that I needed to do to get the scholarships, to get, you know, the free money and go to school and have an, Amer uh, an American experience. And, um, well, I've always done art, always made art. I'd be in my room painting no matter what. Nobody had to tell me, you know, to paint or make art. There wasn't any uh, discrepancy in that. But being Asian, and yes, you can have some microaggression here, I need to go to school and be a doctor, right? Because you need another Asian doctor. So I was a biomed student. Yes, biomed, chemistry and biology. Yeah, and calculus and all that good stuff. Um, I went for about a year and I was like, this is not for me. The students weren't for me. They weren't my tribe. I, this is just, I knew it just wasn't for me. So I switched majors and I went to the arts. And, um, and, and I, knew, I knew that exactly that was my major. I didn't know what I was gonna do, right? I, I knew somewhat that I maybe would love to teach. Um, something that I've always, I think, kind of been good at even when I was younger. I'd help other kids with their homework and things like that, try not to let them cheat on my paper. Um, but so some of these pieces, the loss of faith was really going back and um, reconnecting and questioning my own beliefs as a, as a female Asian woman and, um, and all the baggage that comes with that. So these paintings are fairly big. They're about three by five and they're my early undergraduate work. Um, very expressive. Um, I had a lot of 60s, I call them my, um, the 60 year olds who did abstract expressionists. So all these paint, you know, these painters that uh, my, my professors were these uh, amazing abstract expressionists coming out of uh, California. And so that's kind of what they taught, right? You come in, you just do whatever you wanted to, uh, which was great to a certain point. Um, if you look at this, some of the things that I've put in here, the symbolism, it's called mom weaving. My mom used to weave back in Laos, and she would sell some of that even in the Nankai, even in the villages, uh, to uh, have extra money, because you didn't get extra money in the refugee camps. Um, and uh, so this is really my own ex expressive uh, take on how I felt about the culture, how I felt about myself, this kind of displacement, always questioning identity. Where the hell did I come from? Why am I here? What am I doing here? Where am I going? You know, um, and, and being an, an Asian female, you have a, we're not Chinese and we're not Japanese. And I'm actually <laughs> reading a book called uh, Woman Warrior and, um, and she speaks a lot about certain things that you had to, the, the mold that you have to kind of fit within as an Asian female. Um, and so growing up, I've, I was always kind of that kid who was like, I don't want to take water to you. Why do I need to bring you water for? I'm, you know, why can't I sit with the rest of the males in the group? Why, what's wrong with that? Why, why do the females have to sit in the kitchen to eat? And I would, I was the youngest of seven, imagine that, and um, five brothers and a sister, so I would run to my father, and I would sit next to him while he's eating. And he was like, you can't sit here with me, you gotta go sit with the, the, the women, right? And of course, today you're thinking, what's the big deal? Well, it is a big deal, because A, that's, that's disrespectful, it's a cultural thing. So I've grown up to kinda ad not really adapt, I think I've, um, respected their the culture a little bit more as I've grown up maybe um, uh, and understand that that's just part of it and you can't change culture right away you can't change um, how people think that you should be right away it takes maybe centuries you know um, this actually was uh, a painting done in uh, grad school um, 
uh, about my father who passed away, and it's uh, it's it's talking about the you know how we bargain, how we're in denial, and all the um, griefs, and uh, going back to uh, merging myself with the Laotian culture. I normally don't put the figure in my work, and I still don't really do that. And so for me to go back and really uh, question my identity and place myself in my painting was, um, was something that I needed to accept for th that moment and, and move on. And uh, because my father was a, a big supporter, um, and so and we were very close. And so that painting, these paintings, there's a bunch more of them that starts to talk about nesting and housing and home and being immersed and being enveloped in my own culture and my own, um, the fabric, you know, and the symbolism and things like that. If you go, if you really look into the Laotian um, uh, fabrics uh, and the weaving, it will start to tell you the history of where it came from, like which tribe and things like that, and who made it, which is kind of interesting. You don't think about that, right? Um, <clears throat> so that was grad school. I got into grad school, and then um, some things that I tell my students not to do is, well, don't have a kid in grad school. I had a kid in grad school. I was married, nothing you have to be, but whatever. But I was married, I had a kid in grad school, my second year in grad school. And so I started making these works that, again, going back to identity, but more so maybe removed from the Laotian identity, is more of an identity of a woman as a female and more of um, as a mother. And so these, this piece in particular was made out of all of diapers. I cut them all up, re-sewed them, and it's a really big space. Inside of it is um, uh, the breast pump that's inside, that's hidden inside. So when you walk in the space, it's all white. It's supposed to be like the padded room, like because you're kind of crazy and insane when you have kids. Um, and, yeah, and I still am. I have a 15 and 11-year-old. Um, but anyway, so this piece in particular talked a lot about um, I didn't have postpartum depression, but it talked a lot about the, the um, just just being a woman, you know, and having a kid and having a family and going to school and all the other things that you're stressed out about. Um, and, and then I started talking about memory. And these are uh, pieces that I made. And I wanted to show you this because it gets into a little bit of what I'm working on now. Memory and how, what we remember and what we don't remember. So these are actually um, semi-lacrum basically is something that looks like something else, like Vegas, right? When you have the Eiffel Tower, um, <clears throat> which is in Paris. But then they have another one there. But these are smells. They're jars of smells. And inside. Uh, well, up there are vents, and there, back then we took the computers apart and took the computer fans and then made them into um, these fans that would blow out these smells. So when you'd walk in, you'd be engulfed in this uh, the smell of bread and rain and all this other stuff and really questioning what's real, right? What is real? And, and that takes me back because I was really young, leaving Laos. I still don't really remember any of it. A lot of it, I think, has is, is been pushed back because I don't want to remember it when I hear my parents or brothers talk about going from one refugee camp, which is really horrible, where there's feces everywhere, where there's, you know, you're eating food next to, you know, maggots, and then you're moving to the next refugee camp that's supposed to be a little bit better, and then the next refugee camp. So, I don't remember a lot of that because I pushed it back. Okay, so it, it goes. So these are a little bit about the artificial smells of what we remember, right? Whether it's grandmother's bread or or whether it's um, pumpkin pie, you know, um, smells is something that artists. Uh, contemporary artists definitely push upon because it's so immediate, okay? I mean, you can look at a painting, but it's really not as immediate as if you're walking by and you, you smell bread and you're like, oh, it hits you and it takes you right back to maybe what, you know, whatever memory that you might think of. Um, and then I got this job right out of grad school. I've been teaching here since 2003, so I've been here for a while. I'm the main painting professor. I run the whole area. Um, but so I, I started questioning, again, back to identity. But I was always amazed, for instance, this is my brother. And his name is Kam Gil, Putavang. And that's his real name, is Kam Gil. But when he got his citizenship, he changed it to Chris. And I thought, why would you change it to Chris? And, um, 
and because it was easier. And I understood that, right? As a, uh, but I want to make these works based on that. And there's really quite a lot of people who've changed their first name legally to an American name. I never changed my name. Um, I was asked to, uh, we could. Uh, my, my parents went through it, so I didn't have to go through it. And then you pay so much to get your citizenship. Um, but I was always amazed, again, this, so why would you change your name, right? Because then that takes, that takes you out of the context of where you're from, right? Because come gil, come means gold, and gil means like guild, like the guild. Um, and so, <clears throat> so I, I painted them like, like Liechtenstein, where you have these bande dots, and um, see these, so these dots. And so they're all done by hand and really talking a lot about identity and where we come from and how we assimilate into the American culture. And this is very pop culture, right? It's Warhol. You know, it's in your face. It's bright. It's, you know, glaring. It's, and, and, and that's what it's doing because they have taken away, almost stripped down their first name practically, and just now, now they're part of this American culture, um, which I've always been fascinated by. Um, I'll go on with the next one. Um, now, I get into political things, and then <laughs> there's points where I'm like, oh my god, what am I doing now? And then, you know, you have two kids. And so a lot of my work, I tell my students, is very therapeutic. And um, these paintings in p particular, they are oil and graphite and polymer, which basically is resin on top, um, really speaks to me about time. But it also goes back to going back to identity, right? Um, time, identity, memory. Um, and I'm showing them because it's about being honest. It's about being honest with yourself as an artist. And I am an artist that works in so many different ranges of material um, that I, I don't sit still well. My students know that. I don't sit still. I'm always up and down, up and down doing something. Um, and so going from that, this, these are encaustic pieces. And um, so I got back into the political scene and, and, and I was bothered by all these things that were happening in the world. And this was based off of my interpretation of the, uh, the WorldCom scandals. Um, these are little ants all kind of placed on there with encaustic, which is uh, wax, painting with wax. Okay. Um, this is the attack of the hummingbirds, which is the Enron scandal. Um, this painting is at a salon in Franklin right now. Um, this painting is the one that was seen in um, Gwyneth Paltrow. She selected it for her loft space in Nashville when she was doing a big movie that one time. Um, and yes, they're insects. They're talking about swarmings and beehives and you know taking over. And and you're thinking they're bees, Sisavon. Um, they are. And and you know, but uh, there's different ways of interpreting um, uh, the world yourself, right? And uh, I'm going to keep going. Halliburton, Time Warner, um, and then one day. And again, going back to uh, my schizophrenic way of making art, a bird kept pecking at my daughter's window. Just pecked and pecked and pecked and pecked. It just kept pecking. I was like, oh my god, it's going to kill itself. Um, and it did eventually. And, and you know, and, uh, so I videotaped it, of course, as an artist <laughs> would do. And then I made a piece about it. And, um, but it also talked about resilience for me, right? Be being a refugee, being an immigrant, you're, you're resilient, you're constantly hustling a little bit, you're, um, uh, you know, you're always questioning where you're going, what you're doing, and I felt like I was that bird sometime. And so it's a, a video and these, um, these origami uh, birds are coming into that space. Um, and then I did another piece, which is uh, pigs. So ignorance is bliss. These are all cast pigs um, form. I cast them all. I did, not my husband. Some of you know him. I did it all by myself. <laughs> and um, inside one of these pigs, I hid a $100 bill. Now, they are so hard to get into that, and I had this at a show, they chipped and chipped at it, nobody found the $100 bill. Well, you know why? Well, because the wax that I use is so damn hard, you couldn't get into it even if you wanted to. I mean, you could, but it would take you a while. And the point of that is that 
life is hard and, and you've got to work hard to get at it. And if you really want it, you would sit there and you would chip away that pig to find that $100 bill. All right. Again, going back to resistance about, about how refugees and immigrants are. Um, you know, and I know my title of the talk is Conversational Spaces. These are my conversational spaces, depending on who you're having it with and the time that you're having it with in your life, right? You guys are all young, so you're in a, a certain space and time right now. What are you having a conversation with? Who are you having that conversation with? Um, so I got into um, being a little upset about the healthcare system. Uh, these are called the missing class, and this is a six feet by six feet painting, and there's four of them that's put together. Um, and the missing class are people that don't make enough money uh, to get scholarships, but do, but but they don't ha they don't have enough money, or they don't have let me see they don't make enough money to get the scholarship, and they're not poor enough to get scholarship. So they're in between. That was my family. I, I would be the kid who would go to my cousins like, can I borrow your free lunch ticket? <laughs> because my, you know, because I forgot my lunch. And because we, and it upset me because that's exactly how I grew up. And, and, and reading the book um, by, I think, a lady, I have the book and I can't remember, she's from Harvard and she talks about the missing class. But people, you don't talk about things like that. You know, it's it's not it's. I mean, you don't you just don't, right? Um, it's not it's not like you have a conversation about people who don't have why why can't you get scholarships? Why can't why are these? What's the problem with that? And that's a lot of immigrants have this problem. A lot of refugees because they make enough and they work hard in factories and things like that. And I'm talking about maybe I'm I'm not even first generation because I wasn't born here, right? But like my parents, they worked hard, but there, there was a point it was very difficult to get entrance, and you had to have a job. And yes, they got entrance, but you know there were times where it was difficult. Um, so these are starting to talk a little bit about my pieces. It's about bombing and, and Laos, and even though they're called black mold, it it's goes back into um, this kind of fine thread about where my work's going. Um, my husband's a sculptor, and um, and so I collaborate with Jared quite a bit. And um, this is the gallery that represents me in Nashville. I want to show you this collection because it talks a little bit about, again, uh, mother nature and humans. So a lot of my work, again, connecting to, uh, to you as a person or you as a human being and how does that work in you know, this, this massive space that we have. Um, but these collections uh, are talking a little bit about Again, going back to swarming and you know, uh, concophonies, um, the tempest, things that are coming. Uh, yeah, they're hummingbirds. Put a bird on it, right? Um, I don't even care for that show. But, um, and my students understand why. Do you know why, though, most, I think, refugees do not care for that show? I don't know if Ida's under Portlandia, right? And uh, it's, it's because the humor in it is too is so sarcastic that for us at least for me like listening to that type of humor or uh, arrested development right is it's so it's so british it's so dry where i like i like like stupid jokes like jokes that are like ha ha jokes and my husband doesn't understand he's american he's uh, caucasian he's like don't don't talk to sisavon about that because she just doesn't get it um but my my point is that uh, some of these, uh, I'm off on track, but anyway, whatever. Um, so we collaborate, and he's a sculptor. And um, so uh, we made these bronze pieces, and it's the lost wax technique, which is, takes forever to do. Um, but uh, these are about our daughter. So going back to artwork as uh, therapy, right? And our daughters are growing up. I have a 15 and 11-year-old now, and, and really kind of talking to them about um, because I call, I know it's not PC, but I call them half breeds, and because <laughs> they're they're half Laotian and they're half uh, Caucasian, and um, it's really talking again, going back to identity, right? Um, going back to um, who you are as a person and these bugs, and really at the end of the day, when you die, you just die, and so these bugs take over, and that's kind of my analogy to it. Um, so anyway, these are big forms. We've sold a couple of these pieces, and um, uh, 
these are uh, going back to political things. Th these I have like six of these, but they're encaustic. These are made out of aluminum, and these little in, uh, pens that have been penetrated into the form when we cast them. And these are all the little dots that I've um, dipped. Well, I dipped the paper into wax, and then uh, and then took the hole puncher and punched them all out. But the images are based off of images from the earthquakes. And so different earthquakes that are happening. All, going back, so I'm telling you this also because my work deals with landscape. And if you haven't noticed that, you will, because um, we saw the bugs, and then we're seeing these. And then, um, <clears throat> but these are, uh, and, and, they're, and they're wall pieces. They're low relief wall pieces. Um, this is Haiti. Um, and this is, these are the pieces that, again, kind of landscape pieces. Go, uh, the, pieces that got chosen for the embassy in Suriname in South America. Um, and now I'm working with landscape, but abstracting it a little bit more. So this is, we travel quite a bit, and um, we take the girls everywhere. These pieces are collaborative, still collaborative pieces with Jared. And um, they are low relief, three dimensional pieces. So if you see the shadows, it's because, and I'm, I don't think I have another angle of it, but they come off the wall a bit. And these little spaces are collaged together in my sketchbook, and then I've transferred them and then painted them onto these um, three-dimensional forms, wood pieces that he's made. Um, there's another piece. It was a show, uh, we, we had a show at Vanderbilt for these. <clears throat> but again, spaces, places. Um, um, I wanted also to talk a little bit about, so I'm, I'm going through all this stuff. I'm, I'm working as an artist, and I know Ida wants me to talk a little bit about my NIA grant, which is the non-instructional grant. So my students are crying, well, some of them are, because I am leaving next semester to go to Thailand for just a month. But then I get a whole semester off to just make my own work and my own research. Um, and and. And it's going to be wonderful <laughs> because I'm going to get to teach two weeks in Phuket at an international school for the kids and then um, help them with murals and, and things like that they're working in. Um, and then uh, head up to Nang Kai, where I was a refugee for two weeks, um, and do some research there. Obviously, the refugee camp isn't there anymore. Um, but I'll do some research at the museum and local libraries for that and take shots of the location. Um, and then head off to Bangkok to visit some of the local artists and, and stuff like that. So I'm really excited. And then um, all that time, I'm also making work. And I'll talk a little bit about that for my show that's coming up in February. But all this stuff that we do, like we're also I give back to the community quite a bit. So, and I want to talk a little bit about that. I, I know we talk about this being about me and the conversational spaces as the title, but um, I have conversations with people like at the Oasis Nation International Group. You know, this this place in Nashville, and I was asked to help. Um, create, uh, design, uh, you know, the kids made the pieces, but then we, you know, I designed it, and then they, they spray painted it and told their stories onto each individual pieces. So each of the letters are their first letter of their names in their language. And then we did it kind of graffiti like then we put them all together, and then they, they hung. And so they came apart in three sections, so it's modular. Um, and when you start making large pieces like that with the public, it has to be modular. But what I, I'm trying to get at is, is that I'm not only a teacher, I, I'm also, I, I love to advocate and I love to see that uh, maybe me as an example for them, the refugees and immigrants, that you can come here with $5 in your pocket, not have any shoes like my father, freeze your, I was gonna say ass, I'm gonna go say this, <laughs> freeze your ass in San Francisco, because that's, that's my first memory was the cold, the cold that like touched me, uh, that was the first memory. I, didn't, I don't remember the plane ride, I just remember the cold in San Francisco. And um, that I want them to understand that you're here and you have this opportunity to be able to do what you want to do. And it's, you know, and, and I voted today. And who, no matter whoever you voted for, it doesn't matter. I still think this is the most wonderful country. And I'm not getting paid to say this. 
you know? I know that because my father came here with no shoes and $5 in his pocket, and I'm standing in front of you giving you a talk, giving a talk to you. Um, but the beauty of this project, and then I get to work with the Center for the Refugee, which is CRIT, and we did these exquisite corpse. And there was an app. There's always an app for everything. And um, so we did these apps, and I'll, uh, we actually then took, I took the photograph and put them into this belly where it circulates. And um, so they did three, three pieces, four pieces. They did the robot and these kind of exquisite corpse thingies. And then this was a uh, text and stuff like that that they wrote on there. And then um, this was um, uh, more imagery that they pulled out from their own experience and things like that. So that was a lot of fun with those kids. They were younger. And then I also got to work with KO, which is the Kurdish youth group. Um, well, the story is Kewa. I think it's Kewa. Kewa. I forget. And anyway, um, it's a community project I worked with with the Frizz. And so we made this huge, huge seven by seven feet encaustic piece. And so, um, and you know, we have the, like the biggest Kurdish community. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy how big it is. And I didn't even know that until they asked me to participate. So I've been working with the Frizz. I've been working with Crit and giving back right and um, it's a it's wonderful because um, because even though they're not Laotian I, I haven't really worked with any of the Laotians um, but even though they're not Laotians I'm working with all these diversity and these types of groups that really talks a little bit of, more about what what you are uh, given and what you can do with that um, recently last um, spring I uh, my students collaborated with um, Antonio Vesquez class global studies students and they put a show together called Migration with Dignity. Um, here's a sample of the paintings and then excerpts and um, images of the people telling their story. Um, and then, and then, so then you get all of that, right? So I'm working with the community and I get immersed in this culture. And I'm thinking, what is this? So I go to these conferences and they do not have Lao beers at these conferences. But they do at the Laotian conferences. So anyway, so I go to this writer's um, summit. And this guy has won, uh, I think it's a $50,000 grant from the uh, National Endowments for the Arts for Poetry. And that's Brian. And um, so not only am I involved with a community, I'm also involved with um, a, a group. And the, and the group is these amazing professional Laotians and um, Asians, really. They're not all Laotians. And I'm showing you this because um, I was on the panel, and it was kind of an impromptu panel to talk about being an artist on the panel and, and uh, being Laotian and, um, and, and what our work was about. Um, and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. It's something that I've never experienced before was to meet all these amazing professionals Laotian professionals. Um, and my work was shown there at the Central Cultura de la Raza in San Diego. Those are some of my collages that talks about spaces and places. Um, and then I got invited to go to the Legacy of War in New York. And what is the Legacy of War? The Legacy of War is actually a nonprofit group that uh, educates the public about um, all the uh, bombings in Laos. And Laos is the most bombed country in the world. Um, and nobody knows that. When you tell them you're born in Laos, they're like, where? And you say, well, it's below China and next to Thailand. And you know, um, <clears throat> But there's a huge secret war in Laos. And so those are the bomb craters there. A lot of it was along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, and if you look at, what is it, what they say? Uh, million tons of ordnance on Laos during 580 thousand bombing missions, all right? So a lot of bombs dropped on Laos. And then I got this savvy photo of myself in um, the legacy of war. And it was an amazing experience. So you have all these professionals who come together. They donate money. All these um, caterers, they're all Laotians that come out and donate food and just volunteer. There, it's just all volunteer work. Um, so maybe starting from where I came from, from Nang Kai from Laos, escaping that, coming here, working here, been here for a while. Um, 
and having work, donating my work to the cause to help remove the bombs in Laos, um, and, and some of these other the collages that are inspired by that. And I want to kind of end it by um, my two paintings that I'm working on right now for a solo show at Tenney in uh, Nashville. And these are big four by four feet uh, paintings that are um, my, I know they're abstract paintings, but uh, for me, they're a lot about, again, um, the bombings, the, the crisis that are happening, um, you know, and just this centrifugal kind of gestural marks that talks about the strife. Um, but also, going back to um, remembering, right? And, and thinking about where, where did I come from? And um, so, <clears throat> I think I have a great photo of us at the end, Ida. And then there's a, there's a photo of Ida and I at the end. Um, I was a very serious child as a kid. And I think the older I've gotten, um, I'm not as serious anymore. And I think I was very serious because I was a refugee, and I had to be. Um, so I, I guess I've let my hair down a little bit. Um, Ida is, is very nice Asian woman. Uh, and um, anyway, but I want to. Con I I know we have a little bit of time, right, Ida? So I know I've gone through a lot. Okay, and, and you've seen a lot, and you're like, oh my God, she just keeps going and going. Um, you have any questions for me? Yes, dear. So you were talking about um, you went to pre med, and you went from pre med to yeah. art. Yes. That's a really big jump. Not really, because I've always made art. I, I was like the president of the art club, you know, and, and I've always. I've always made art. It, there, wasn't, there wasn't a disconnect, right? And so I took as many art classes. Well, actually, I probably took more biology and chemistry and calculus and all the other classes versus art. But I've always was part of the art culture. Yep. So there wasn't really. I just was in denial. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I wanted to eat. You know, I like, I like lobster once in a while. Um, I'm doing fine though. What? Who else? Who else got a question for? Yes, dear. Ah, oh God. This is a student of mine. This is Kayla. Yes, Kayla. Okay. So in your in your earlier work, yes. you have a lot of repetition. Yes. Through a population. Yes. And in your later work, mm -hmm. you step back from that. Mm -hmm. Is it because you become more acclimated into the culture, or? I'd say yes to both. I think I think because I feel more comfortable in my skin. How about that? I think I um that I didn't feel like I needed to. Ne I, I felt like it could be a little bit more vague. Is that kind of where we're getting at versus specific? Yes. I mean, if I had more work up there of uh, now, you guys don't have to take slides. But back then, we had to take slides. So um, I have works on slide that really talks a lot of things that are very specific installation pieces that really digs a little deeper into the Laotian culture. Uh, one piece in particular is called He Kill. And it's not he kill, but it's more like it translates into the American culture to being slut. Um, and um, so, and then I had another piece about my parents watched a lot of uh, wrestling. And I had an, an installation photography performance piece that I did that I kept asking a question to my parents, but the, but the answer was they weren't listening to me. And in the background was the playing of, of wrestling. They're, you know, that's just because. They, you know, they come home, they're tired. They don't want to talk to you. Um, I could barely even get anything out of my parents when I was younger. Um, so that was another, does that help? Yeah, later on, I felt like I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to justify as much. Yeah, who else? Yes? What's your favorite medium? Oh, God, that's a horrible, that's a good question, but really bad. Um, you know, I didn't show you, well, I did show you some of the classical stuff. If you look at the bees, they're all, you know, they're all acrylic. But um, uh, I don't really, I know it's a really bad answer, but I really don't have one. But OK, if, if they said, all right, Sisavan, you're going to die tomorrow, what, what are you going to pick up first? It'd probably be oils. I love oils. I love the smell of oils. I, I love the tactile feel of oils. Um, I would probably pick up oils. She's, she's shaking her head. But I would probably pick up oil paint. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Who else? Anybody else? Yes, back there. So when you uh, switched over to art from biology and came off the medical track, yes. uh, how did your appearance <laughs> well, um, you want the, the uh, non-explicit, no. Um, <laughs> no, they, they weren't supportive, you know? They said, you're crazy, you're not gonna make any money. What are you thinking, you're smart. Um, uh, what's wrong with you? I mean, and my dad was in medical school, my mom came from a pretty well-to-do family. Um, you know, in Laos, and, and you know, and, and you want to eat. And I mean, yeah, they thought it was crazy, and I did jump into it. And when I tell my students, it is a little scary. You know, you're fumbling through the dark at times, and you're really questioning why, what are you doing? Um, but I'm very happy where I'm at, you know? Um, I get to do what I love, right? I mean, every job you, you get or have, there's always gonna be some part of it you're not gonna like. I mean, so, but I knew, um, that wasn't the field for me. Yeah, they didn't like it. Who else? Had another question over here. Yeah, I was just wondering what um, the atmosphere was like in Kansas when you emigrated there. Because I know that Nashville, you know, it's kind of a refugee yeah. hub right now. Yeah. So it's a little more well, I. I, well, we moved from Caney to Winfield, and Winfield, I want to, I, I like to say there were probably maybe. 20 families there, Laotians. So I grew up with a lot of Americans, a lot of, um, uh, so most of my friends were Caucasian, they were white. Um, there were some who were really mean, if we're getting to the racist part, you know, a lot of uh, gooks and, and all of that other derogatory remarks. Um, uh, and you just, you know, you didn't get used to them, um, but, but I knew that they were also ignorant, you know, and so th I, I grew up fast. Fast. And when you have to go and translate for your parents when they go to the bank, or that you have to translate for them when they go to teachers' conference, it takes a whole, it's a different ball game, right? Yes, mom, she is saying I've got straight A's. No. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's the dynamic, people were very accepting in certain cases. I actually, I call her, um, I had a, a, I call her my, I, I know I'm not PC, I call her my white mom. But uh, she, she taught me, she seriously did, she, she taught me how to um, have etiquette. She taught, so there was a few of us, my sister and I, I don't know if I just heard this story, and she, um, she was just with the Baptist church and she kind of took about five or six of us in, not in a weird way, but kind of like, kind of groomed us a bit, and um, she loved my sister. I was kind of a, the badass, you know, with a potty mouth. And, um, but, and she, uh, but I, I learned etiquette, I learned to ski, I learned to bake, I learned to cook, that my mom, my mom's a horrible cook. My dad, on the other hand, um, was a wonderful cook. And so there's, there's a little Mr. Nomer there about um, women being good cooks. But, um, but so, you know, I, I learned the American way through her, and it was kind of uh, surreal uh, because later on we kind of, kind of move in different paths in our lives, and it still saddens me today a little bit that I don't know her as well um, now that I'm a little older than, um, than when I was a kid. But yeah, so, but it was, it was strange. It was strange, but I had a lot of American friends, um, and, and um, yeah, yeah. Who else? What else you want to know about me? Well, I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I know I went through it fairly quickly. Um, but, uh, and if you have any other questions, well, you can always find me on campus. Um, and you can always email me. Uh, and you can ask Ida questions. Thank you.